everybody welcome and thank you so much for coming to this machine reading maps event it's a great uh it's great to see so many people back in the center this is the first really large group we've had back since the pandemic and it just feels like home again which is really really wonderful so thank you so much for all of you being here and for all the work you the folks who are working on the machine reading maps project have done to make this a reality uh, I'm Julie Sweetkind Singer, and I'm the Associate University Librarian for Collections and Public Services. And my background here at the university has almost been completely in maps and geospatial information. So May 1st will be the start of my 24th year of finishing 23 years here at Stanford and started as a map librarian after working for David for about a year or more uh, as a map cataloger for him, uh, putting up the first website uh, for the Rumsey Center together. So that was really neat, 1999. So let me introduce to you our panel uh, that will come up and talk about um, what we see as um, where we're going to go with this. How do we think about this intellectually from the point of view of understanding what this can do for scholarship, what this can do for students, how we can think about using this type of tool as we go forward. So let me introduce each one. Yes, please. Uh, first, I'd like to uh, introduce Nora Barakat. I hope I said that correctly. Okay. Nora is with us from the Department of History. Come on up. She's a historian of the late Ottoman Empire and a modern Middle East. Before coming to Stanford, she taught at NYU Abu Dhabi, where she co-founded Open Gulf, a consortium of projects that documents the history of the Gulf region. Open Gulf uses the original um, Recogito platform to annotate people and places in textual documents using natural language processing tools to automatically identify these named entities in larger corpora in order to build a research gazetteer of the Gulf region. Of particular interest, she contributes important thinking around how to work computationally with Gulf regional languages, both transliterated and in Arabic script. So uh, quite interesting given the questions we had earlier about uh, languages. Uh, Nicole Coleman. Nicole is the digital research architect for Stanford Libraries and the research director for the humanities and design labs at the Center for Spatial and Textual Analysis. Nicole has been working to create, visualize, and understand complicated humanities sources using digital tools for many years, participating in projects like mapping the Republic of Letters. She writes regularly about the role of AI that might play in research libraries and has convened conversations and experiments at Stanford libraries to test ways that AI methods can transform discovery and research applications for collections. And she's currently working with our um, marine biology, uh, my marine sciences librarian on understanding text and uh, species occurrence uh, in student papers. Peter Leonard, hiding here. Uh, Peter Leonard is the, uh, the assistant university librarian for research data services here at Stanford Libraries. Peter recently joined our libraries from Yale where he was the director of the DH lab at Yale University Library. He has a PhD in Scandinavian literature of particular interest today. His work to co-develop co PixPlot with colleagues at the Yale DH lab is of interest. PixPlot allows people with large image collections to cluster images with similar semantic content. Uh, we're glad Peter can join us to reflect on the opportunities that working with very large data sets of text on maps can present to libraries and researchers. And let me tell you, this really floats Peter's boat. He has the office right next to me, and he will call me and, Julie, come look at this. This is really cool. And he'll show me. The other day, he was showing me a huge corpus of uh, photographs and putting in words like joyful over the Stanford Historical Photo Collection where it's not in any metadata, and yet you see clapping and you see people smiling or dancing. So really neat uh, applications. And finally, Karin Wigan. Karin is in the Department of History here at Stanford. She teaches Japanese history and the history of cartography and is a geographer by training. She has written extensively both about the ways that geography informs economic change and the role that cartography plays in shaping ideas about place. Her work in world history has inspired many to explore the conceptual history of continents and oceans, 
Recently, she published a volume co-edited with Caroline Winter, her about differ different representations of time in maps. And Karen, you've been one of the strongest supporters of the map collections, both here and at Branner Library over many, many years. And we are always delighted to have your students come in to, uh, to our spaces and use the materials that we have. So thank you. So we'll start out now with asking each of our panelists to just give us a little bit of a uh, introduction to what they have thought about and what they, where their thinking is going around looking at this new tool, what opportunities it might provide for them. So just some off the cuff comments and thoughts that they've had as we start. And then once we can get a ground, a uh, little groundwork done there with people understanding um, sort of your thinking and where you're at, we have some questions and prompts and then uh, we'll talk for a little bit and open it up to the audience. So we want this to be casual. We want it to be a conversation between our four panelists, myself and all of you, as we think about what are the next steps that we can take in understanding how these can be used in scholarship. So I'm just going to go straight down the line, and Karen, I'll start with you. Okay, perfect. As you may have told if you were listening to those descriptions, there's nothing digital in my bio. So I am really one of those historians who just fell in love with maps. And what they mean by supporter of the center is I bring my students here all the time. And I spend as much time here running conferences and going to conferences as I can. Because I think the ability for multiple people to look at the same visual object, which often is originally very small, together on these big screens is transformative for what we can do with maps. So that's, <laughs> that's just a word about my background. Um, I have known about this technology for approximately two weeks, uh, two busy weeks during which I had a lot of other meetings. So I'm not here to pontificate at all, but I'm sure your brains are sparking from the presentations today, and certainly mine has been too. Um, I, I loved the questions that already came out of the panels or the presentations earlier, partly because they drew attention to a lot of the things that have also drawn my attention. The way that fonts themselves become clues to the kind of map that you might pull up. The ability to look either in the mosaic version or the, the grid version, and we have found, my husband and I were playing with this together, we found that the grid version is, uh, is for our purposes, really the most useful interface, although the tile version is makes great wallpaper. <laughs> um, it's really fun. But I wanted to talk about a couple of applications that I could readily envision. One is I visited the map division of the Library of Congress early in my career. And I got an enthusiastic response from the service person who was helping me out, the curator helping me out, because I wasn't just doing genealogical research. Evidently, mo most of the work that the public does with maps in big public collections is trying to find, as in <laughs> the case we heard of um, Toronto, um, trying to find a hometown for our ancestors. That's a but you know what, this would be really useful for that. And it's not easy. It, I don't think most amateurs are able to find those places readily or historically, at least with the tools that were available 20, 30 years ago. So I think that this is fascinating. And as already came out in this example, the ability to search for, you might call it corruptions or variable spellings, and the fact that the AI is already throwing those up for us without us necessarily even knowing we're looking for them. A lot of them surface and give us new ideas about ways to, to search. So the first thing that I thought of doing it was doing with it was doing a little genealogical research, but I, that I, I think a lot of people will. It'll be interesting to see. Um, but the more there are many more sophisticated things one could do, and a couple of examples came to mind. One is uh, a lot of place names are very political. And the example from my part of the world that I study would be, what do we call the sea between Korea and Japan? There are maps, big expensive globes at Stanford have been defaced because people were unhappy with the choice made by the, the cartographers. And so that's a really vivid example. And we could go through with the time slider bars that we also have in the, in the Rumsey collection and watch the pattern of naming in Western maps. Right now we can't access the ones in, in characters, but it won't be long, I think, before we can. But we could actually watch the growth of the Japanese empire and the acceptance of the, the calling this the Sea of Japan when earlier it was most often called the Sea of Korea. I think that kind of uh, work and assigning little projects like this to students 
creates the opportunity for them to really grasp very quickly how political these decisions are. Um, and the other thing I just want to briefly mention is looking for lacuna. This is one of the things that humanists need to learn how to do, and it's hard to see what's not there. Well, this tool gives us a way to do that. And I want to give you an example. <laughs> My husband, Martin Lewis, co-author on that book that was uh, flashed up earlier, thank you, um, He's doing research right now on the Black Sea region. And there, a part of that region 100 years ago was commonly referred to as Circassia until the Circassian people were genocided by the Russians and their regional appellation drops off of maps. And so within a couple of hours or probably less, he was able to see that pattern analyze when the maps came up, how big of a terrain was called Circassia, was it given a boundary, how it floated around from one part of the Black Sea to another, actually, north of the Caucasus, south of the Caucasus, and then how it disappeared. And then to write a blog post about it, that's already up. So that's fast. And as was pointed out this morning, the utility of this tool to identify within seconds the corpus of maps you want to look at out of 60,000, <laughs> what can you say? It's breathtaking. So I will stop there, but I'm just here to learn what other people are doing with these things too. Wonderful. Um, thank you very much for that, uh, for being first. Um, I was told don't show slides, but I'm gonna show some slides because I think, I think they build off something Karin just talked to us about. Um, so I promise this will be quick. Um, space is coming to my rescue. Got it. I think so. Okay. Oops. Oh no, it's it's on the, the big screen. It's on the big screen. Yeah. Um, I want to build off some of the ideas that I think I've heard from all of you guys today, including uh, Karin, and I know the thoughts that are going to be coming from the rest of the folks on this panel. And I think this is partly a um, credit to David's collecting prowess and uh, his generosity, and also um, to all of every other collection that's here at Stanford. But it's not an insult to say that we're living in an era of a kind of digital surfeit, an era of too many items, or sometimes what feels to me like too many items. Um, and I'm going to be talking about digital surfeit in two contexts. One of them is how text on maps, how the ability to search for text on maps exists in a context of all of us, whether we're data scientists, computer scientists, or digital humanities people, traditional humanities people, are need these strategies to encounter and deal with and transform and find what we need in this world of digitized cultural heritage. And the second thing I want to do is talk about text on maps as a potential opportunity for some of the critical cartography that I think Karin and others are very interested in. The first thing you want to mention is that it's not only David's map collection, Stanford's map collection that's big, it's every humanistic data source in the world. Um, I did my postdoc on the corpus in Google Books. Back then it was not 40 million. It is 40 million today, thanks in uh, small part to Stanford libraries and many other libraries around the world. Articles in JSTOR are 12 million. If you're an art historian, there are 2 million images in uh, art store. Uh, Greg Crane asked us back in 2006, 2006, he asked, what do you do with a million books? Um, and I think he, he just sort of articulates in that article, how do we even change our, our reading methodology uh, or our sort of searching methodology? We could also point to other folks like uh, Franco Moretti and, and others who try to tackle this. And I think there are two broad categories that have been tried. And what I really love about um, sort of machines reading maps or text on maps is that it really is an important one that's been underdone. So the first method I think we're all sort of familiar with is this notion of what Cotty Berner has kind of called the macroscope. Uh, from Indiana University. And this is this notion of, well, what if we take just like thousands and thousands of David Rumsey's maps and we think about them um, as a collection visually? Um, and of course, you can do this. You can look at all of David's maps and you can look at them and, and, and sort of be overwhelmed by this digital surfeit. And so what you might be interested in doing is using uh, sort of machine vision, computer vision to reorganize those maps into areas of kind of semantic similarity. And that's what we're doing here. This is our strategy to basically look at clusters of images 
um, in David's collection. So you can see that although it looks like I might have just thrown these maps on the floor, um, in fact, all of the sort of landscapes ended up here on the bottom left, and there are some really interesting, I don't know if these are described as sort of relief maps here. So there's some visual clustering going on here in all of these maps. And this is a way of letting us kind of build these macroscopes to understand the relationship, the visual similarity between these items using convolutional neural networks and then projections down into two dimension. What's exciting about searching for text on maps is the exact opposite approach. It says, I know I'm looking for the Sea of Korea, or I know I'm looking for this particular contested place, this vanished place, this place that's in a different language. Here we're looking for the former name of, of Oslo, Christiania, which shows up perfectly in David's collection and even puts a little pinprick on the map where it should be. So these are like two complementary approaches alongside the notion of big scale data visualization. I think we need things like text on maps to allow us to go exactly to where we wanna to find today text, maybe tomorrow symbology. I wanna close by taking up this notion of a map that I don't think is in David's collection. Um, this is, uh, I just got back from Norway where I was in the National uh, Museum there in Oslo. This is a map produced, a series of maps produced by a Sami artist starting in 1974. Um, these are Sami place names in the province of Troms. Um, and uh, Hans Ragnar Matthiasen worked on this uh, and he did iteratively many interesting maps from uh, what he would probably describe as a Sami perspective. And by that, we mean the indigenous folk of the far north who are spread throughout Russia, Finland, Sweden, and Norway. Um, there's a lot of interesting details in this map. It is black and white. So I'm gonna choose another one that he produced, which is a little bit more, even more beautiful, um, which is uh, again, all of the place names in Sami languages. Um, and there are many Sami languages. North Sami is perhaps the most uh, widespread today. I wanna zoom in on the bottom left of this map and look at three things in order before I close. On the first thing that I wanna point out is that they're all, all of these place names are not Swedish or Norwegian. Um, they are in, in Sami language. And especially as you go farther up in Norway and Sweden, you might see some correspondences between modern, for example, Swedish cities like Hulefteo on the top and then Umeo below it. But these are not represented that way. They're represented in the language of the folk who originally lived there. Second point I wanna make is that we have this inset map of Scandinavia here. Um, and you'll notice that if I were to put this into machines reading maps, um, I guess it would get the names okay, but they would be upside down, right? So this is an interesting question as we do with, deal with alternate projections. We've all seen the beautiful meandering Mississippi. What are we gonna do with like completely upside down place names because the layout of the projection is completely different. And the last thing I'll mention on this map, um, is there anybody in the room who speaks Latin? Please, somebody has got to speak Latin. We might recognize this as a reference to um, the Gallic Wars, right? That um, uh, this is uh, Hans Ragnar's own intervention into a description of a foreign place. At the bottom left, the Latin says, Scandinavia is a unit divided into three parts, just like Gallic, right? One of which is inhabited by the Laps, another by the Lapalaiset, which is an old name for Sami folk, and, an, and a third called Sabmi in their own tongue. And Sabmi, spelled either with a B or a P, depending on your region and your, your, your decade, is in fact the way that folks in the far north refer to themselves in ours, Finns. So I'll close with that and go over to Nicole. So um, fascinating. I I have a, a different take on this, and and those um, uh, who were here earlier this morning, um, let me talk about. Well, there's there's two points I guess that, that I want to make. One is um, looking at what made this possible as a project. Um, I think of this project overall as a digital humanities project, as a digital humanities project that is particularly complex um, and the the nature of collaboration and what's possible with a far-reaching collaboration like this with the number of experts is is really extraordinary and in the time that I've been at Sanford to see this happen is um, is really is really really wonderful um, and I, I think it's important to recognize uh, that what we see at the end or what we get to interact with or play with um, through David Rumsey's site, working with his collection, um, is something, you know, we have to think about how that actually came in, came to be. Um, 
the, all, all of the pieces that make that happen. Um, the relationship between that and you know how do we make this function similarly for um, the maps in the collection of the Library of Congress um, or you know at Stanford's uh, collection more broadly. Um, these are the like real practical challenges um, of making stuff uh, uh, work. And I, I guess I'm going to call out and just acknowledge um, how important it is that everyone has committed to this. This is a, um, uh, a series of relationships built over a, a long time uh, that made this possible just to envision it to be able to write the grants to get this work started um, through the Turing. And, and I think, you know, David's work of carrying this over the line by actually making it happen on the Luna platform for his collection um, is, is it's, it's very, very important for us to, to kind of see, I guess, you know, behind the curtain and understand uh, why that's so critical. Um, because now that we can envision it, uh, because it's been made real, Others are going to want this, right? Um, and that's going to be the catalyst, I hope, <laughs> to really make this happen. And that is so incredibly precious. But what's a, a big challenge, and this is my second point, um, is going to be a big challenge with that, is it, it's going to also mean uh, engaging with materials in this way where, you know, as Katie was showing in her presentation, uh, and, and Karen was referring to, you know, there's all, so much about contested space, contested names um, within these maps. We're going to be dealing with data that are changing, evolving. You know, we have to be thinking about a living archive of data um, and engagement um, with this material that's going to continue to evolve that um, in many ways we're not really prepared for um, you know, within libraries. So it's going to uh, force us to, to kind of rethink and be prepared for this. I think this is um, the future. Uh, and it's something that we should be doing with other archives as well within the library, leaving this contested space, um, not, you know, categorizing things, describing them, putting them in a box or on a shelf, um, but really, really engaging with what the possibilities are um, of, of a living archive as this can be, um, in large part um, because of the way it's been structured, because it was thought of uh, and in, um, from the ground up as a scholarly project. Um, you know, the, the annotation um, uh, tool being, being so critical to that. So um, I, I think in terms of um, the design of projects, how do they get to actually happen? All, people have all kinds of fantastic, great ideas, but actually making it happen, that's extraordinary and uh, kudos to everyone here. But uh, it's something we need to be thinking about um, as, as we move forward. This isn't gonna happen on its own. Um, we need to continue to push for it. Thank you, um, Nicole, and thanks everybody. I'm really honored to be a part of this group as I've been listening to everyone. There's just a lot more decades of experience here than, than I have with this kind of work. But um, I, I'll talk about my experience with or thinking about this tool first as a researcher and then as an educator. So as a researcher, um, first of all, Julie, very generously um, introduced our, uh, we call it a research collective, Open Golf, or, a, or a, um, a research group, Open Golf, which is focused on historical texts about the Persian Gulf and working with them digitally, just you know, on, the, on a very superficial level, but an important one, when I used to search for the Persian Gulf or many of its other contested names in the Rumsey collection, I would get about three or four, maybe, maybe seven to 10 results. And now I get tens of results just because I can also look at the the text on the map. So this is huge for understanding what's there for me um, uh, about this region that I'm that I'm working on. Beyond that, you know, what's really been clear to me in listening to these these presentations today, and when we we met a couple of weeks ago about this, um, is that this tool really makes me interact with the map um, and focus in on the text. And I was going to say the toponyms, but then Katie's presentation made me realize it's not only the toponyms. Um, in a, in a different way, and I'll try to explain what I mean. So for example, in Open Gulf, we spend a lot of time looking at different imperial representations of, for example, Southern Iraq, right? This is a region that has historically been very contested, especially between, in the, in the time period we look at the most, between the British and Ottoman empires, right? 
And from the Rumsey collection, I might find a few um, usually British or other um, Latin alphabet uh, produced uh, uh, maps about this region. There's also great Ottoman maps in the Rumsey collection about this region, and I'm really looking forward to um, the language capabilities to be able to, to get those through the search function. But then I'll also be looking at, at texts that are not visualized at all or where the, the um, data, the information is visualized in a very different way with a very different reference system, not the kinds of, of systems that we're used to seeing on these kinds of maps. And similar to what, what Peter was, more similar perhaps to what Peter was showing with these, um, with these Scandinavian maps. And this tool, I think, gives me a way to think about like the role that the place name and the toponym is playing on the map as text alongside these other representations of space. In a, in a way, it allows me to sort of extract the text from this particular visual representation and compare it um, that I think will be, will be sort of um, very generative and perhaps really transformational, right? In the context of Ottoman history, which is where I usually am when I'm not um, working on open gulf, there's been quite a bit of anxiety about um, how the cartographic tradition in the way that we've, we've trained ourselves to think about a cartographic tradition is not as deep as the one um, you know, in, in European imperial traditions, in Russian imperial traditions. And this gives me a new way to think about the way that these imperial entities were listing places, counting, you know, listing commodities, counting people, describing people um, that isn't quite so focused on the particular geographic reference system that, that we're seeing in the map. And I hope this is, I, I should have also had a slide to show you what I mean, but the Ottoman Empire would have blocks of text that say a place name, um, a particular commodity, a particular person, and a bunch of numbers. And now I'll be able to think about that alongside the text on the map, I think, in a very different comparative way. So that's the sort of research uh, uh, application that I see. There's also a big pedagogical application, though, and I've been working with students, as Julie said, for a number of years, annotating text using Recogito. And when I first um, encountered the annotation element that we were introduced to today, I was like, this looks just like Recogito, and it's not a coincidence because the same person is making it. But Recogito, I mean, it's, it's a powerful research tool, but it's also such a powerful pedagogical tool. And I've been, you know, basically trying to bring student um, interns into the same space around the same historical text to annotate place names and correct each other's work. And sometimes it's people who are spread from Stanford to Cambridge to Abu Dhabi, and they're all able to work on the same text through this really powerful collaborative tool. And, and also like the checking and rechecking has also become a huge element of our work. And now to think that we'll be able to do that with, with maps is, is a whole nother element of our work, but I can also just imagine using it in the classroom, right? Trying to get students more engaged with digital history methods. This is a very easy way to construct an assignment, right? Um, go in and look at this particular map and make the corrections that you wanna make and you know think about the way that the text is corresponding or not corresponding to the annotation. So um, that's the other part of it that I'm that I'm really excited about. And thanks again for including me and congratulations to the team. It's really, really tremendous. Great, thanks all of you. Did any of you have anything you wanted to respond to in terms of what the other people have said that you haven't had a chance to uh, talk about? I just want everybody to help us think about the title of this whole venture. I'm thinking machines reading maps was iteration one. You're already into humans helping machines read maps. Machines helping humans read maps. <laughs> but the human element's really getting in there, and that's, that's kind of wonderful. So let me start uh, with a question uh, for uh, Karen and Nora, because both of you talked a little bit about uh, historical research. And uh, Nora, you spoke to this just a minute ago, but how do you see this changing maybe undergraduate inquiry, which you maybe discussed, but also graduate or faculty inquiry. How does this, how do you think that this could impact? Um, and Karin, I think about you with your um, introduction to MAPS course that you do each year with your undergraduate classes, this kind of ability to engage. Because I know when I've taught with MAPS before over my years, um, you would bring students in and it would be hard for them, some of them, which David and I affectionately called when we were working together, you, we could tell if they were map people. 
And these were people where you'd put out a map, you know, people would come to David's uh, place and we would bring out all these materials and they would either do this or they would just stand back and just sort of look, right? And when they would do this, we'd say, oh, they're map people, right? Because the, the, the information was so compelling to them. They, could, they wanted to be closer to it. They wanted to examine it. And then, so I see that with the students that I would bring in, that some of them really got it and understood it and other people saw it. They, they weren't taught how to read something so graphical. And I'm wondering how a tool such as this can help us with people who struggle with this sort of graphical display of information uh, that, that's maybe a barrier to learning or a barrier to integrating maps into the kind of research they do. I can, I mean, you actually just articulated what I was trying to say, not very clearly about how I am thinking about this as a researcher, right? Not even as an, as an educator, because I think it is this, there's something very powerful about being able to extract the text, right? And I, didn't become a map person until after I finished my PhD, actually. And I um, also am, am a person who's constantly lost and has no spatial sense whatsoever. And so I actually really relate to those students that don't necessarily think that this is the kind of thing that they, this is not their thing, right? And I think once you, it, it's just about highlighting the text boxes. It's a very, it's powerful for discovery, but it's also powerful for, for really thinking about how the text is sitting on this particular kind of representation. I don't know, I, I think it really changes the way that we interact with the map. And I hope to be able to articulate that better and articulate it to my students. It, uh, for Karin too, it's been a busy two weeks since we were <laughs> introduced to this, but, but that has been what I've been, what I've been thinking about, about a lot. I think there's, there's a lot of discussion to be had about how we actually apply that in the classroom, right? And like where we, you know, do we extract a list and then ask them to look at the list and the map? I mean, I don't, that, that will take more thought. I'll just say I experienced something that I think Katie mentioned when we were first introduced to this tool just a couple of weeks ago, which is that it turns out that giving users the opportunity to improve the database, to make minor corrections, turns out to be a real hook. It turns the user into somebody who's active and not just a consumer. I got hooked within minutes. Like I want to move those little dots, and I can see that a, a place name got split, and I just I I I thought, oh no, there's hundreds of millions, <laughs> How, you know. But I I think that it's it, it. You're right that just seeing a map annotated this way with the colored boxes transparent, realizing you can play with it. It's I have colleagues who've done the same thing with Wikipedia. Like, let's go in and see what in Japanese history doesn't have a Wikipedia article yet, and let's write one. And just the deep lesson that that, I think, conveys about the constructiveness, the social quality of these tools that otherwise they interface with just as consumers. I think that's actually surprisingly powerful. I don't know if I'd want it to be in the first week. I'd like to approach maps a little differently first, but at some point I think it'd be really really fun to see how they respond. It's a great question. Julie, can I just to respond to that? Um, I, and this is also sort of what I was trying to get at with um, uh, what it means to think about tools that are designed from the ground up um, with with scholarship in mind, but you know it, it could also be with crowdsourcing in mind because that's a big part of digital humanities work, and that informed it. I know that um, uh, Drake Zabriskie was telling me that was you know early early efforts were uh, around crowdsourcing annotations um, before um, the the amazing work that uh, that Yai's team um, did at University of Minnesota to just accelerate um, uh, that. But still, you know there is a there is a very strong tendency um, within uh, computer science, you know, generally, especially working um, with machine learning, artificial intelligence, to to build things that are from end to end, right? Things that just do it for you, you know, build a machine, not a tool. And and I think that what we need, um, and uh, and and my boss has been emphasizing this and in, in, in getting people really enthusiastic about this in, within the library here, um, that tools are so much more often what we actually need. And that 
to me is precisely what you were saying, Karin, about the human. The human is now in this. It's the humans helping machines, it's machines helping humans. Um, it's really thinking differently um, about, you know, maybe we don't want the uh, machine to do everything for us. We actually, that point of being able to make decisions to inter, the intervention um, is really important. It keeps alive that contestation. Thank you all. Peter, I was hoping maybe you could talk to us a little bit more about what you see and um, what you imagine might be important next steps when you start to think about, you, you, you talked about 40 million books. We now have 100 million place names in, or 92 million place names in these maps. Where do you see it? You've worked a lot with large data groupings and trying to understand and, and extract information from that and extract learning from that. Where do, you, where do you see the possibilities here? Well, I think the most important thing to say is the best ideas I had, I think the Luna team and the machine reading math team are already on it because I've heard so many great comments just today. Um, what I think would be really exciting is the notion of like a heat. So we have two wonderful search results page, each of which do something different and can be good or bad for different situations. We all love the grid view where you get the little pinprick of where your thing ended up. And we, we love that kind of masonry layout, especially the whoever thought of to look for Mississippi. That was the great thing to see the sort of. Um, there are other ways that results could be displayed. If you imagine, instead of individual items, imagine a, um, an arbitrary abstract worldview, some kind of projection, doesn't matter what. And if I look for Springfield, imagine if there was a heat map of all the places in this country where Springfield is, right? And you would say it's a lot in Missouri or, you know, I don't know where these cities are. Um, if you did Yerba Buena, you might see one, a, a huge heat map in the Yerba Buena gardens or whatever. But on old enough maps, you would see Yerba Buena is like the peninsula of San Francisco. So there's some interesting ways of visualizing not the actual artifacts which David has collected, but the sort of um, totality of the search results as a kind of weather map across a Mercator or some other arbitrary projection. I think that would be really interesting to see. You could also do that on like church or, you know, firehouse or something like that or lighthouse, right? You can start seeing these and where they're clustered. Um, I think that would be really interesting. I also think the notion of, um, we've heard before already about the really interesting task of reconnecting letters that are so hard, uh, so spaced out that they don't, they barely appear to us or they're difficult for us to read. I think that as was discussed earlier today, that really asks us to think about the act of reading and at what scale we're reading. Sometimes you miss Europe if you're two inches away from the map, but you see it if you're all the way out. So I think there's some um, great challenges ahead of us uh, there that the team is working on. And then finally, I know the entire team is very focused on symbology and about non-textual iconographic representation or other forms of representation. Here we think back to what the New York um, NYPL labs did many years ago with the Sanborn fire insurance maps, a very simple color segmentation to say, well, this was probably a wooden building because it was tinted red. So that type of sort of pretty simple computer vision could, I think, tell us a lot. Um, Probably, as I'm sure we've talked about, most useful in, in series maps where there's consistency of iconography, but still figuring out what's abstractable from there would also be exciting. I think it's interesting. Um, I, I mentioned to a couple of folks that I had read this uh, wonderful book, uh, The Invention of Nature, about a uh, biography of Humboldt. And Alexander von Humboldt was such an amazing figure and towering in his time. And if you could do a heat map, you would see his name pop up all over the world and it gives you a sense of his impact and what he, how he was thought of during his time. Why, why would you see his name all over, literally the whole world he's represented on maps? And so it's a very interesting sort of thought process that, again, I think about for uh, inquiry at a basic level to get people to think about how they can use cartography in order to understand the world in a, in a way they perhaps hadn't before, I think tools like this give us that opportunity. It also reminds me when you mentioned the, the Sanborns, I can remember very early on uh, when uh, the maps were being scanned, it must have been in the early 2000s, uh, David and I were meeting with one of our scholars here, a history professor, Richard White, who was doing a lot of work on the railroads. And we were showing him the scans of, of uh, the um, county atlases and different atlases. And he said, that's really great, but I wanna, I wanna be able to search for church. And here we are, 
maybe 20 years later, being able to do what Richard had wanted to do and had been envisioned all those years ago. So it's really exciting to see that this has come as far as it has. While you're talking, another possibility <laughs> dream occurred to me. I just wonder if this is feasible at all. In some parts of the United States, Native American place names have survived in much greater density than in others. But in order to find them, you'd probably have to be able to look for parts of place names. And it would be the same in Japan. There are Ainu place names that survive in modern Japanese, but you'd have to look for the, the last part of it. Um, and I just wonder if, if you think that's something that we'll be able to do at some point. I could imagine a linguist having a field day with this kind of data if, the, if they can get in and do an, uh, that, ki that level of phonemic almost analysis within place name data. Let me bring you a, okay. Can you say more about uh, what do you mean by last part of the place name? Right. Yeah, yeah, that's that's very very interesting. Um, we have been we have been looking at uh, uh, again. We don't have the domain knowledge, so we have been looking at data driven approaches to help us understand how street names in the entire U.S. change over time and space. So um, I, I think somehow it's related to what you are saying here because a street name, you have a street name, but that name, for example, um, Jefferson Street, that can make, mean many different things. So we have some hypothesis about the semantic of that name in similar, um, in neighboring regions could mean a topic. But how do you define a topic? How do you define semantics? What are the, external knowledge that you can use. These are all very interesting problem that we are looking at. So we first take all these uh, three names, I think covers 120 years and uh, have their first built date in the US and their approximate location. We try to take them and link them to uh, a knowledge base. I think we use Wikidata or something else. We use a knowledge base to help us provide the semantics and we group, we, each of them will match to multiple uh, entities in that knowledge graph because by stream matching, you don't know which entity this is referring to. And we start to look at their spatial clusters, temporal clusters to see if we will be able to identify changes and to see if the changes make sense in a, in a global, not global, the entire US and depends on the regions. I think these are all very interesting problems require um, domain knowledge in history, linguistic, spatial, geography, and also computer science too. So it's, it's a fascinating project. I just, yeah, I just wanted to add on that. I think the street names is a, is a great kind of like other case, uh, similar problem, but this, this issue of kind of looking at like prefixes and suffixes and, um, is, is something that people are doing, yeah, already with, with other data sets. And unfortunately, I can only give examples of like in France, which is not, you know, an, an under-resourced <laughs> sort of um, uh, area of, uh, for the study of place names. But, but this is precisely the kind of thing that, yeah, like computational linguists are very interested in. And now that we've got this data and we're learning to explore it, we, I think that it's the perfect time to include a bit more of that expertise in the team and and um, and to work with historians, I think that we're starting to have conversations with you know some specific community engagements projects in Southern California, but um, but not yet around uh, uh, First Nations or or uh, those kinds of things. And you know, obviously, gazetteer development for those communities 
uh, is really important and shouldn't be done, you know, outside of collaboration with those communities. So I think the first thing is like, yeah, we don't know what those words or parts of words would be, but the the most important first step is to find the people who do have that knowledge and learn about how they would want to go about searching and enriching or transforming or contesting. And that is what, you know, I, Valeria spoke so eloquently about that earlier, that that's really important. But yeah, as linguistic information, setting aside, just pretending like the data is perfect, as linguistic information across time and space, this is just uh, invaluable for so, so many domains and research questions. Maybe just to follow up on that, the, what you folks have been discussing and also in response to Julie's question of what new features, I've heard this discussed amongst the team, so I know this is not an original idea, but if you think about searching as um, delivering a set of results, and let's choose Springfield, right? We've got all these results for Springfield. Um, they're all clustered around the cities that are actually called Springfield. But you've also got um, some results, let's say you have one late early 19th century map, which does not call that town Springfield, it calls it something else, right? Um, and if that is not ex extant, if that's like the, it's like, it's like a hey, it's like an incredibly rare result, but it's smack where Springfield should be. That's in a sense a more interesting answer than the 400 lists of Springfield from Rand McNally. So because we have, we have an imperfect relationship between um, space and the, uh, what the sort of pixel space of the map and the geospace of the coordinates because we don't know how the person lettered it or if it's to the left or to the right. But still, I think there's some signal about oddity or uniqueness in a given geographic radius. You could almost imagine a searching uh, result ranking which said uniqueness of term for that, geo that sort of space on the map or on the globe. And that would actually be like, what are the unique names for this? In the case of some regions, it might turn up indigenous names or older names because actually the fact that it isn't Springfield and, and the rest of it is, is actually that signal that could be really interesting. Can we talk just a little bit more about uh, the non-English language sources? Because I think this is something that's come up a few times in this uh, discussion. And it's interesting to me to think about um, Karen and Nora, maybe you both have worked with it. And I know that, um, Nicole, you have as well. When we have, um, we know that results for the non-English language text on maps is of a lower quality at this point. Uh, perhaps most definitely in the, as you uh, have talked, uh, some of you have talked about a little bit with different character sets and that sort of thing. How does it impact the way you deal with maps in general and data? And are there implications for this variety of quality or where do you see the big uh, leaps forward if you're able to, uh, if we're able to, to take this kind of technology that we're using now and apply it to these uh, other types of characters that show up on maps? Yeah, this is basically my entire life. <laughs> um, yeah, the, the, I mean, again, like my own experience with, with these methods is relatively new in my longer research trajectory, but what's become very, very, very clear to me um, since I have started working with these tools is just how much they have been developed in a Latin alphabet centric um, computational environment, right? And so often when I start trying to use, and you know, the languages I work in are Ottoman, Turkish, and Arabic, and Persian, all of which use the same um, alphabet, and it's a um, right to left, you know, script ish connected letter alphabet we run into all sorts of problems. So a lot of the stuff with named entity extraction, a lot of the things that you can do in Latin alphabet text is um, are not are not possible with these same tools. I'm very excited, I mean, that it's, it's gonna be, I think, soon possible um, to look at place names on maps, um, both in, you know, left to right environments and, and with this script, it's been actually really transformational for us. I was talking to, um, Reiner about this before that that we can do that in Recogito, right? So we work in Recogito in Arabic, in Ottoman Turkish, both Arab, you know, with Arabic script and transliterated into modern Turkish, and it's been you know wonderful to be able to do that. That's been one of the main things we've actually done with graduate students is annotate um, texts in a, in 
a multilingual, multilingual environment, and then we can compare toponyms in different languages. Um, you know, I was just thinking when when Karen was speaking in Open Gulf, one of the biggest challenges we have in actually locating historical toponyms is that both um, the Turkish uh, government, the Republic of Turkey, post uh, in the 1920s and um, the Iranian government, also in the 1920s, did massive language reform and place name changes. And so if we were able to like expand the scope of um, of this tool into other collections and also other languages, we'd be able to kind of chart that in a very, and, and probably find a lot of places, locate a lot of places that we haven't been able to find, right? Just because it's very difficult. Um, you know, it takes a lot of really deep historical research for each place name to find actually where it was. And we're talking about, you know, a data set of 50,000 toponyms. So when are we ever gonna finish the thing? If we have to spend four hours looking for each place, so something like this would be would be really um, uh, transformative. But the other, I mean, the big challenge with some of this is also, you know, all of these fonts, right? And the 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 equivalent of that um, in the languages I work in is is these different calligraphic styles and different handwritings that do come up in spatial representations, right? Um, and and that is a frontier that we're working on with narrative text and that we haven't really cracked yet, right? There's not good handwritten text recognition um, for these uh, for these scripts at this point, and for um, for right to left in general, and so it's it, right to left languages, and so it's you know that to me that's like a whole another step that we need to get to, right? To be able to to do that kind of um, of text analysis, but but yeah, I'm curious to hear what my colleagues, especially working in other, because this is goes back to the language group problem, right? Like they all really do have pretty specific issues if you're thinking like a computer. I think it's interesting too. I think of the Japanese military maps that we have in our collection where you have the, uh, where the Japanese had gone through during the Second World War and they had taken maps from wherever they went in. So you would have Russian maps overlaid with Japanese characters or you would have, um, yeah, Dutch maps, you would have all these different languages superimposed on top of one another. And it will be interesting to see how that works as maybe it's it's the models have been set up to read one language and not another, but that gives you information. So I the, the possibilities here are just endless, it seems to me. Yeah. Uh, questions from the from our audience? Yeah. Um hold on, we'll bring you uh a mic. Thank you. Uh, when you did the last map search, you know, the troublemaker in my mind said, well, I wonder if they would do a search that said slave market. I wonder what would come up. And and I'm, and I'm it occurs to me that if you have a, um, if you think of, you know, what, what's, what sort of a, uh, search method for correlates of geographic information and names, you know, it, that's going to cause, uh, you know, problems for people, that's going to cause upset, that's going to cause confusion. It's, you know, AI is going to be really good at generating that, right? I mean, it's going to be, you know, absolutely no cultural sensitivity whatsoever. And, and so I'm wondering how you're thinking about uh, the problems that are going to occur, because of course, they are, you know, you mentioned the Sea of Korea versus the Sea of Japan. There's so many places where uh, disputed territories are, uh, you know, very emotional subject. And so, and I could imagine, you know, uh, an AI looking at a series of historical maps and saying something in a normative way that would be um, uh, extremely offensive. Seems a little bit orthogonal to that, but I wanted to share with the people here because this is such a thoughtful um, an innovative group. There are Native American peoples who are creating maps of their sacred territories that it requires being initiated into their sacred knowledge to decode. And they're doing that specifically because they're aware that once it's out there, they can't control the distribution of the image. The only thing they can control is the, the key to reading it. And so depending on how much you know about the community, you may be able to read at different levels. 
And I, w I was really thinking about that earlier, especially, I guess, with Katie's uh, very appropriate comments about reaching out to the communities you want to work with. Uh, there are so many that have either been, they've had maps made of them and for them, you know, for other people. Um, I think there might be really interesting points of resistance. And what one of the things this technology is going to do is break down walls and barriers and make it much easier for outsiders very quickly to figure out where key things are, right? It, and it, the example, the other example that comes to me is, um, and I think this was an issue for the Rumsey collection, local maps in, made in Japan during the 18th and 19th centuries identified the neighborhoods of people who were discriminated against. By name, uh, they, have a, they have a status label that is a very ugly word that got a, appeared on some of the maps. People who are now scanning those maps and making them public are really concerned and that the descendants of those communities are concerned because it's illegal to identify them now in Japan. It's illegal to discriminate against them on the basis of that background. But how do you hide it? Once the search tool's out there, the text is on these old maps, are you gonna scrub the maps? That doesn't seem completely right to a historian. It's not completely truthful. But what kind of, it, there is mischief that could be made with that information. So it, pedagogically, this is fantastic. You can put this out and just get students to think about how complex the moral issues are. In terms of policy, I don't want to have to be the one who figures it out what to do. But I think those are issues to think about. So thanks for raising it. You know, this also makes me think about silences on maps because you can start to search for words that don't appear, that you may think about what what maybe was not depicted. And Karen, when you were speaking about this, it rem I rem remember when I first started working here, I sat in on your maps class. I don't know if you remember, but it was one of your undergraduate map classes. And one of the first examples you had, I believe you showed a map of Charleston. And it was a beautiful old map of Charleston. And you asked people to talk about it and to see what did they see. And then you started asking them, what do you not see? And what you didn't see on the outskirts of the town were the slave cabins. It's a slave market. You started to talk about what was chosen not to be put on the map. And it was a really um, illuminating moment for all of us, I think, in the class when we started to think about what isn't shown and the decisions that are made by the um, map makers as to what goes on or doesn't go on a map. And so I think these are interesting questions when you start to think about how we search for words and names, because that gives you information too, as we know. So it's there's a lot in the silences as well. I think we have time, we're, uh, we're right at four. So maybe I'll hand it back to you, Stace. Or do we have one last question? What do you, any other questions from the group? It's been a long day. Good, good. You wanna ask our last question? I forgot your name, Nora. Nora, so you were talking about Iraq and the Ottoman and British influence. And I was wondering in the search, we talked about the maps, we talked about Google search, and I would be really curious about how we might integrate those two to have the maps from the various times and names and people writing about that area during that time to see how did they describe it. So we see a place name that gives us a lot of information I would love to see two pages of how someone was describing the situation. And I, I guess that's really to the larger group of you know, how should we and how do we integrate sort of the textual world of Google search with some of this great stuff with that map search. Linked data. <laughs> I I cannot answer that beyond saying I think linked data is the is the answer, but the way that we're trying to do that with the open gulf, very aspirational years down the road, would be to have a kind of interactive, you know, to have a kind of interface where you could look click on a location and then see not only what the British are saying about it, but also not only what the Americans are saying about it, very importantly, but a whole bunch of imperial and other entities that have been interested in that place 
Um, and those would be, you know, stuff that's not only discoverable from Google, but stuff that, you know, is, is actually not digitized, but maybe historians have analyzed, you know, so that it would be an even sort of a, hopefully a richer, but who knows when it's actually finished, what AI will have, will have, will have created um, for us. But I'll let Stace and others talk about linked data because I'm not the expert. I'm just really interested. I just wanted to quickly follow up on that, at least for those who didn't hear earlier. Um, it, you know, Nora had mentioned uh, that uh, you know Anatorius looked a lot like Ricogito, and of course, um, it, and, and then that's no mistake um, because uh, you know Reiner, uh, he's he here was is responsible for that, and Ricogito is of course um, very very much tied to linked data, and that this the the team explicitly uh, did state that that's the uh, in in the in the plan absolutely is to is to incorporate linked data. So. Please join me in thanking our panelists for speaking with us today. Thank you very much. Dace, I'll turn it back over to you. All right. I want to thank everyone who stuck it out for the whole day, especially those of you online. Uh, we had a great uh, uh, set of folks uh, attending online. Um, thank you for sticking with us. And uh, that brings our online live stream to an end. <laughs>